So welcome everyone to the fifth annual Center for Great Lakes Literacy BioBlitz webinar. Uh, my name is Ginny Carlton. I have the pleasure of serving as the Education Outreach Specialist for the Wisconsin Sea Grant. And I'd also like to acknowledge some of my other colleagues, Ann Moser and our two phenomenal Education Outreach student assistants, uh, Greta Nashold and Madeline Anderson who were essential in organizing and promoting this event. Unfortunately, due to classes, Madeline isn't able to join us this afternoon and Anne is actually um, hosting another webinar uh, simultaneously, so she's not able to join us either. I wanted to also thank uh, Greta, who's agreed to manage the chat this afternoon. So if you have any questions or difficulties, please go ahead and add those to the chat. Um, you may also notice that at this meeting are some of my Wisconsin Sea Grant colleagues. We're located in other cities across our great state. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are guests on the traditional homelands of the Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, and Potawatomi peoples. Wisconsin Sea Grant is an organization working for diverse, thriving coastal ecosystems and communities. We embrace the value of both Western scientific approaches and local indigenous knowledge to strengthen our relationship with the waters, land, and people of Wisconsin. You may have noticed at the start of the presentation, another logo. There are also representatives on the meeting today from other Sea Grant programs. Many of us are part of a collaboration of educators located across the Great Lakes Basin known as the Center for Great Lakes Literacy or Seagull. There isn't a physical center, but there is a lot of cooperative programming. For example, in the spring of 2020, in response to the pandemic, a colleague at Minnesota Sea Grant envisioned, organized, and hosted the first Great Lakes BioBlitz programming which laid the foundation for today's event. Siegel's goal is to grow a community of Great Lakes steward stewards. I encourage you to check out the website for additional information and hopefully uh, Greta can put that link for you into the chat. Um, our presentation today features the work of Michelle Kenton, a third year undergraduate student at UW-Madison pursuing majors in conservation biology and data sciences. I first met Michelle in the Wisconsin Wetlands Association Wetland Science Conference in Green Bay, where she presented during the poster session. And I found her research really uninteresting on jewelweed, rather very interesting. And I was especially intrigued on how it intersected with the iNaturalist Community Science Plant Platform. So without further ado, let's hear uh, more about Michelle's research. And as I stop screen sharing and she uh, begins to screen share, um, I would ask that as a courtesy, if you haven't already done so, if you could turn off your cameras and mute your microphone during her presentation. And while she's getting set up, if you could also perhaps, if you haven't already had a chance to do so, put into the chat a favorite, favorite watery place that you like to go and explore. Awesome. Thank you for that introduction, Ginny. I'm just going to need one second to screen share. Let's. Oh, that's my inbox. Okay. Can everyone see this okay? Yep. You're still in uh, the slide creation mode. So if you click the little link at the top there on the far right that says slideshow, we should be all set. Thank you. Terrific. Okay. Perfect. Um, well, like Jenny said, uh, I do research on native jewelweeds and we use a lot of resources through iNaturalist to collect our data. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and then we should have some time for questions at the end. Um, so these two plants here, these are the two native jewelweeds to the United States. Um, on the left here, we have impatient scapensis or common jewelweed. You can see the flower is a bright orange with some red speckling. And then on the right, we have um, impatience pallida or pale jewelweed, which is more of like a pale yellow flower. There's a little bit of speckling on the inside, but overall it's pretty, um, pretty plain. And you can see that these two flowers are very 
very different from each other, very easy to tell apart. Um, but if we look at the plants themselves, like without the flowers, it's much more challenging to distinguish between them. Uh, they're both short and kind of shrubby. They have these green, long, serrated leaves that are about the same size. And again, we have um, Impatience capensis on the left and Impatience pallida on the right. But you can see these two photos are much more similar. So without the flowers, it's a lot more challenging to tell them apart. And why does this matter? Um, so we have Impatience pallida and Impatience capensis growing in the same regions throughout the country. If you look at this map here on the right, everywhere that there's striping is where the common jewelweed is growing and everywhere that there's this yellow color is where the pale jewelweed is growing. And you can see that the range of the common jewelweed completely overlaps with the range of the pale jewelweed. So they're growing in the same places. Um, and the flower is the main way to identify between them. If you're looking at like a field guide or dichotomous key, that's gonna be the trait that they're telling you to, to use to identify. Um, but jewelweed only blooms for a few months out of the year. So if it's not June, July, or early August, you're not gonna be able to tell them apart. And it's important for a lot of different people, surveyors, um, scientists, federal workers, to be able to do species counts and know how many are growing in an area. So they need a way to identify um, throughout the year, not just when they're flowering. So I was working with Dr. Rachel Tochalowski from the United States Forest Service, and we wanted to look at, can we use the leaves to identify between the two plants, looking at the shape and size, as well as the color. Um, and we use iNaturalist to do that. So if I just go back quick to that previous slide, we're looking at this huge, huge map of a range. We wanted to collect samples from all across the area. And so using iNaturalist allowed us to do that. Uh, we made a project page, which you can see here, um, which is like publicly available to anyone. If they have the link, they can access it and they can join. And we posted some information about what we're doing, saying, hey, we're looking to collect uh, these two types of jewelweed. We left some instructions on how to do that. Um, we had that all set up. Um, so some benefits and features of iNaturalist that we used are again the publicly available project like having a space to store all of our information and our methods and connect with different people was really really important. Um, another feature of iNaturalist is that you can collaborate on identification so someone can post and say hey I took a picture of this pale jewelweed and other people can endorse that and say yeah I agree like that's pale jewelweed I agree but you can also say oh you know I think it might be this instead and so it opens up a place for for those identifications to you know get some feedback um which is good and then you can also view like who has made observations besides yourself so this screenshot here is showing the observation screen i can look at it shows um the species it shows the user and then the date and places collected which is super helpful so use that and then there's a direct messaging feature so you can see all of the users are highlighted in blue i can click on them and send them a message um, and it just helps you connect with a really wide audience. Like anyone that has a phone or computer and access to the internet can be part of a project on iNaturalist, which is really super cool. Like you don't need any special like qualifications or training. Like you can really just be anyone. Uh, so to communicate with the citizen scientists, these were kind of the steps that we took. So first we made that project page, which I showed you earlier, which had a summary of um, like what we're looking for and the type of work we wanted to do. And then we posted really specific instructions about collection methods, which is important because if you're ever doing research, you know that you want to um, standardize your collection just to make sure that your data is accurate. So we requested that people collect from the very top of the plant to account for any variation in size, like from the top to the bottom. Um, and we also asked for only one leaf from each plant in case we had a plant that was particularly large or particularly small, if it was an outlier having just one sample from there wouldn't affect our data as much as like 15 samples from that one plant. Um, and then most importantly, we had people wait to collect until um, the plants were flowering. So we could positively identify and make sure like, yes, we know this is common jewelweed. Yes, we know this is pale jewelweed, right? Because if we didn't know, then that kind of defeats the whole purpose. 
Um, so once we had that all up, our next step was to find people who identified jewelweed and message them about the project. So this past summer, I was working at a desk job, and whenever it was slow, we were kind of allowed to um, like work on independent work or do homework if it was the school year. So I would just log into iNaturalist, I would go under observations, sort by most recent, click on the people that had seen it, and just like spam message. Like each person only once, so I wasn't spamming each person, but just sending out message after message being like, hey, like this is what we're doing. Like I noticed you found this plant, would you be willing to collect? Um, and a lot of people were really, was really responsive, um, which was super awesome. And yeah, I did a bunch of messaging. I actually got banned from iNaturalist for too much messaging. They thought I was a robot and I had to reconnect with their support team and be like, hey, I'm a real person. And luckily they let me back in. So you do have to be careful about that if you're planning on doing something like this. Um, but once we got, once we got back in, everything was going fine. Um, messaged a bunch of people and then we had them collect the samples and press them and then have them mail them to a local address here in Madison. And I had a mailbox set up for me at the in the botany building at my school, which was nice. So I didn't have to send it to my real address, um, which was super helpful. And then earlier I showed you that map of like where the distribution is. If you remember, it was all like the Eastern United States and up into Canada. And we were able to collect from all along the East Coast and the Midwest. We had a few in Canada and a few on the Pacific Northwest, which was super cool. Um, but again, like we could not have sampled this ourselves. It would have taken many, many months to go out to all these different places and find where the jewelry is and wait till it's flowering and take the sample. Like it would not have been feasible without the support and the help of all the people who are interested in our project. And then once we received the samples, the next step was processing. You can see this picture on the left. This is my mailbox. I was very popular um, compared to the other people, which was exciting. It was fun to get the different leaves in the mail. A lot of people sent them in like greeting cards or birthday cards, which was cute. Um, and then I had this scanner. Um, it belongs to the state herbarium, which is also located in the same building I was working in. So they loaned it to me. And it's basically a flatbed scanner that they flipped upside down and then mounted on a platform. And then this crank here moves the platform up and down. So in this picture, it's in the up position. Over here, it's in the down position. And you can see that I have a leaf here. It might be small on your screen, but I have a leaf here. It's ready to scan. And then we also used color cards to calibrate um, because in previous collections, we had used a different scanner. So we wanted to make sure that our color data was going to be accurate. This is what some of the scans looked like. This scan on the left is from the 2021 uh, collection. You can see it's a little bit brighter. If, it's hard to tell between the leaves, but if you look down here at the color card, you can see like the RGB values are much brighter than the newer scan. So it was important to um, take that data so we could adjust the colors in the scans. And then these were our results. Um, so over here on the right are all the results. Everything in bold was statistically significant. Um, so we found a statistical significance in size, both length and width, as well as area and perimeter. Um, we also found it in the red and green intensity of the leaves and the shape of the leaves, specifically the roundness. Um, and here you can see these are some box plots just illustrating um, those differences again. So on the left here, we're looking at the length of the leaf. The orange here is impatience capensis. The yellow here is impatience pallida. And then this thick bar in the middle is like the average. So you can see the average impatience pallida leaf is at least a centimeter or two longer than the impatience capensis. Um, but there's still an overlap with like a good chunk of the, the leaves themselves. Uh, which is why it's important to be able to tell them apart. And then on the right, we're looking at the width. Um, so again, impatience capensis in the orange, impatience pallida in the yellow. You can see here's the average width, and it's probably about a centimeter wider than impatience capensis. And then this was our principal components analysis, uh, which basically says, like, what traits can we attribute variance to? 
So the first principal component accounts for the most variance. You can see here it's 47%. And then as we go down, each component or each trait accounts for less of the variance. And then in the center, we're looking at the average leaf is like this. And then as we move further away from the average, um, we see a narrower leaf, which I think is, you can go back and look. The narrower leaf would be, yeah, Capensis. And then the wider leaf over here is Pallida. Um, and why is this important? So now we know that leaf shape and color can be used to identify it in patient's capensis and in patient's pallida. So if I went into the field with a ruler um, and there were no flowers, I could be able to tell hopefully which plant is which, which is very exciting because that means that they can be identified in more seasons throughout the year, not just in those few weeks when they're blooming, um, but into the spring and into the fall as well, which is exciting. Um, which opens up more opportunities for accurate serving, um, more research and species counts and things of that nature. And then I just want to, again, reiterate like how important community engagement was like for our project. Uh, so I contacted over 1800 users and we had almost 900 recorded observations across the two countries, which is kind of, that's what we're looking for. Uh, we had 183 different people observing for us, and in both 2021 and 2023, we collected over 200 samples, which is very exciting. Um, and I don't know if any of you have ever participated in projects like this before and wondered, like, oh, like, is it really helping that much? Like, it, it really is helping that much, because um, like, we definitely could not have done this without, um, without citizen scientists. And so if you have the opportunity to do a project like this, I would definitely, definitely recommend it because it makes a huge difference and it's a super fun way to get involved. Um, and that is all I have for you in my presentation, but if you guys have any questions, I would love to answer them. I'll stop sharing. Um, So um, we can either just uh, go ahead and open up our microphones to ask questions or go ahead and put them in the chat, um, whichever you prefer. Um, there is a little raise hand uh, button on the bottom too. And I'm just gonna have uh, Greta help us if there's questions in the chat that she can relay them to Michelle. That would be lovely, thank you. So um, Michelle, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, I really uh, was very curious to hear a little bit more about your work. And um, at, the, at the start of this, I didn't realize how many different people were involved in helping you to gather these samples. And it sounds like um, it's been a, a very large endeavor. Are you planning to collect more samples this summer or what stage is your research in at this point? Are you are you re-replicating again? Uh, that's a very good question. We are actually all done with collecting. Uh, we did two rounds, one in 2021 and one this past summer in 2023. And right now we're just looking at um, processing the data we have and then hoping to get results out. Um, and finalize soon. Yeah, so um, how how do you anticipate you're going to be sharing results? Are you doing a paper or what are your thoughts regarding that? Um, we have, or I have a paper draft that's written right now and I just need to finish up the color analysis um, and then we're hoping to submit by like the end of May and have that published soon. And we also did have a few people like when they were submitting leaves commented like, hey, like, let us know how it turns out. Um, so we do plan on reaching up, out to those people and letting them know like what happened with everything, which is very exciting. Yeah, and I'm sure they'll be very interested in hearing how their efforts have helped you as well. Definitely, because it might just seem like, oh, I'm putting a leaf in the mail. Like that doesn't matter at all. It's so fun and silly, but it really makes a huge difference and it's very valuable um, to us and I'm sure to other people with similar projects.
have, I'm curious of, from our audience members, um, whether or not they have experienced jewelweed in the wild themselves. If you could just maybe answer that question, yes or no. And if yes, which or both of the species you may have encountered, or I'm just curious as to whether this is a plant that you're already familiar with or not. We do have um, individuals from all across the Great Lakes Basin, um, including New York, Pennsylvania, and Ontario, who have been registered. So we may get some um, really interesting ideas. We're having quite a bit of chatter in the chat. Um, I hope you guys can hear me. My Wi-Fi is pretty crappy, but a lot of people say that they have seen it. Um, some have said that they don't. I also wanted to go return to a question asked by Denise Duffy. I have never used the app Picture This, but she asked if it's anything like the Picture This app. I don't know if anyone else here has used it, but. And um, I actually was a Picture This user before I got onto iNaturalist. And I really enjoy it because it's Picture This it's more like, I don't know what plant it is. You take a picture and then picture this will tell you, um, which is a little bit different from iNaturalist where it's like, you take a picture of a plant and you think you know what it is and you identify it um, or you invite other people to identify it. Um, but both are taking pictures of plants. I think both are fun. Um, I'm not sure if picture this has the same project um, capabilities that iNaturalist does, but yeah. Michelle, there was another question for you. Um, someone was wondering, Janice was wondering if the project sparked any other research questions for you related to the work or otherwise. Definitely. Um, I would be curious, and I haven't like looked into this at all, but I'd be curious to see if like the similar methods that we used of looking at leaf shape could be used to identify like other similar looking species you know like besides like two jewel weeds um like it would be cool to see that expanded uh, to other similar plants so th thank you very much michelle for sharing your research um with us today in the last few minutes that we have. Um, do keep adding some questions to the chat if you have more. But in the meantime, I want to take a couple minutes to tell you a little bit about um, some of the upcoming events with uh, Wisconsin Sea Grant and the Center for Great Lakes um, Collaborative. We will be hosting a BioBlitz. Um, if you're not familiar with the BioBlitz, it's basically an event held during a particular period of time in a particular location. Often they're done in person on a particular piece of property, for example, a school site or a particular state park or nature center's property. In our case, um, we host this virtually and all of the um, images that are collected are posted to iNaturalist, hence the connection to uh, Michelle's work. Our Great Lakes BioBlitz begins on Earth Day, April 22nd, and it runs until May 18th this year. We typically hold it for four weeks. Um, and if you don't have access to a phone handy and aren't able to snap a picture of the QR code, in just a moment, um, I'm going to be switching slides and um, hopefully uh, Greta can also add to the chat our link to a Google site where we have information about how to join this um, particular effort and also some educational resources if you're working with students or community groups. So the uh, Great Lakes BioBlitz resource page was put together by Greta. Um, so thank you very much for uh, organizing all of this. You'll notice at the top, there is a little uh, menu about the BioBlitz, then today's webinar, some information about iNaturalist. If you're not familiar with that app, it's a free uh, downloadable app for your phone, or you can also use it right on a uh, computer via the web. And then, as I mentioned, we have some 
additional educational resources. Hope that you're able to check out that link. Um, Greta, is there anything else um, specifically that you want to add about the pages that you think might be helpful to our audience members? Not to put you on the spot here. <laughs> Um, a couple of things. I do want to shout out Madeline, who's not here. She put a lot of work into the website. I did a lot of the iNaturalist setup, and I will be posting weekly challenges on iNaturalist to get you guys outside and to get you guys engaged, as you mentioned. Um, there was one more question in the chat that I want to address quickly, um, and it's by Denise Suffy, and she was wondering if you take pictures of something on iNaturalist and you need an answer of what it might be or how to identify it, do people usually respond, or is there a way of doing this? Michelle, you might have insight. I kind of know that people who are part of the group at least can look and identify them as they see fit, but I don't know a way of increasing or the pace of identification. Yeah, I think it really just depends on like how quickly other people see it and how incorrect your first identification was. Like I know I've seen things and think they're one thing and I'm like super off and people right away are like, uh, I don't think so. And they like post on there and they help me like understand what it is, which is pretty helpful. Um, and then again, like some plants look pretty similar to other plants. So those might not get different identifications as quickly. I think it really just depends like how active other users are on the app and how often they're looking at those identifications. And I would add, it also depends on how often that particular thing Thing is seen and how widely known it is. So for example, if it's a white-tailed deer or a gray squirrel, there are many people who are aware of what that species looks like and feel comfortable confirming that your identification is correct. Whereas if it's a um, obscure dragonfly or some other um, order of insects, there may be less people with working knowledge of how the species are identified. And sometimes you can't easily identify it from a picture unless you have an image of a certain part of the anatomy of that species. And so it may be uh, much more difficult. iNaturalist does not require an identification down to species. You can identify even at the animal plant type level, if that is what you're able to get started with. So um, it's kind of a neat uh, opportunity to learn more about the wildlife that's out there and that your colleagues that are part of the project are also seeing. One other tidbit is as you're um, loading images, if you're taking a picture of the same organism, um, so in other words, the same jewelweed plant or the same butterfly individual, and you take 10 images of that same individual, they ask that you group those into one observation and post them collectively. Um, and that way, it's kind of representative of what that one individual is. If you happen to see two, um, you know, squirrels and you have images of each, then those should be uploaded separately, images for each individual organism that you've taken pictures of. And that helps to give a little bit of the variation in the actual organisms too, like every leaf isn't exactly the same. So in our last one minute here, I'd just like to give you a, a summary of the links that we shared with you today. Um, obviously, our Sea Grant, Wisconsin Sea Grant page, our seagull organization, and then this link to the BioBullets webpage. I want to thank you very much for joining us today. And a huge thank you to Michelle for sharing her work with us and her research. Um, we hope that you continue to use both iNaturalist and study the plant communities in the Great Lakes region. And we hope others will join you and get out there and participate in our annual BioBlitz this year as both observers and perhaps identifiers as well. I'm going to stay on uh, the meeting for a little while in case others have questions about the BioBlitz or other things that I might answer, but that officially concludes our session for this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you out um, bio-blitzing this spring. 
Thank you for having me, Jenny. Well, you're more than welcome. I'm so glad that you said yes. We've enjoyed working with you and seriously uh, hearing all about the uh, work that you've been doing. It's It's been a fun opportunity for us too. Definitely. And I'm sure we'll connect again sometime soon. Yeah. I'm going to stop the recording. So maybe that will encourage people to ask some questions too.